growls, she drools, he snarls, she fools. He or she, does it matter when the monsters crawl? Since our childhoods, across communities, countries, and races, we as kids have listened to stories about dreaded ghosts and giants even if they might have never walked on the earth, inflicting a sense of differentiation between good and evil, morality and immorality, and even sanity and insanity into us. Did we really head towards where we were supposed to after all those learnings? It's a difficult topic, but our psyches developed a sense of fear for all those things that were not good. If we think about it, we still fear the dark and the unseen as that little us hidden somewhere in there tries to go back to those scary tales from grannies and mamas. It makes us tremble from within to show how these monsters have grown up along with us within us, carefully nurtured by our own fears. Ray Harryhausen was one such global granny, a stop-motion animation specialist who gave those dreaded little imaginations within people a definitive shape and life. He could get the hell out of them with his wonderful and skillful art. He achieved such a feat by bringing the best out of those mythological or fictional gigantic creatures which had only a bounded amount of terror associated with them till then. Ray started his full-fledged special effects animation career with The Beast from 20 Thousand Fathoms in 1953, and went on to create several memorable monsters during those days when special effects were more a manual skill and not a software skill. Here, let's check out 10 such iconic creations from Ray Harryhausen that made him one of the greatest special effects specialists the world has ever seen to date. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Cyclops. Cyclops are humongous, scaly, and hyper-aggressive creatures who are natives of an island called Colossa and appear in the 1958 movie The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. In this Technicolor fantasy movie, Sinbad, an adventurer and a sailor along with his ship and crew, reach a mysterious island called Colossa, where they encounter a sorcerer called Sakura. Sakura is escaping a ferocious-looking creature called Cyclops. Men are no match for the merciless giant, as it almost defeats the men as spears and knives don't seem to bother it. But as it always goes, the movie loops around the fact that no monster can match a witty brain. The plot highlights how Sinbad the Sailor rescues Princess Parisa from Cyclops and the antagonist Sakura from his devious plan hatched to induce a war between the kingdoms of Baghdad and Chandra. Cyclops bears a horn on its head, with sharp protruding ears, and features a single eye at the center of the head. Its body is draped with a highly scaled skin, and the legs imitate a horse or a bull with hocks and hooves. The monstrous creature seems to have an appetite for human flesh, and is seen to be overtly aggressive and cannibalistic. We see it when Cyclops is trying to fry the captured crew of Sinbad during the treasure ambush scene. The giant doesn't seem to possess normal intelligence levels, as we see it being defeated with brainy moves from its opponents. The incredible patience of Ray is clearly visible as we realize that all of the special effects were shot using stop animation during days when technology was way behind what it is today. The shots are marvelously watchable and enjoyable even today, as Harryhausen carefully crafts his violent models to play the whole sequence step by step to perfection. <laughs> The Kraken. The Kraken was one of the iconic antagonists among the crew of Titans who valiantly fought against the Greek gods and lost. Kraken I among the survivors was banished to serve god Poseidon who kept it as his pet. Kraken is seen throughout the movie Clash of the Titans of 1981, where it's first seen being unleashed by Zeus against a city called Argos. This was to avenge the blemish of King Acrisius when Acrisius intended to kill his own daughter Danae, who happened to be the love of Zeus and his grandson Perseus. Acrisius committed this fearing a soothsaying that the offspring of his daughter would be his doom. Later in the movie, Kraken is also pitted to consume Princess Andromeda, the daughter of Queen Cassiopeia of Joppa, by the god of sea Thetis. The goddess was trying to strike even with Zeus, who had cursed her evil son Calibus for destroying his godly horses. 
The monster, in a thrilling conclusion, wars against a courageous Perseus who wants to save Andromeda, which makes it a slurpy finale. Kraken, half humanoid and half cephalopod, has a muscular chest and arms with webbed sharp claws. The squamous, oily, textured, dark face with webbed skin all over the body makes it look intimidating. The tentacles squirting out all around its arms make this unearthly beast one of the most fearsome opponents. The fishy tail makes it an agile underwater creature and can take on water fights adeptly. Ray Harryhausen makes the Kraken model with a lot of experience as the movie comes at least 23 years after his entry into cinema. The finale as Kraken wakes from the sea to stare at his potential meal Andromeda and other humans is mind-boggling. Harryhausen ushers in the intended expressions in each frame with a gradual change in his model's face till the end looms. Near. This gem is an alien. In the movie 20 Million Miles to Earth, the US Air Force executes a secret mission to the planet Venus. They return with a gooey compilation of alien eggs. The mission crash lands and the eggs end up with a scientist. The scientist looks over the hatching of one of the eggs into a little reptile body which is called the Emir. The Venusian native soon starts growing rapidly due to the abundance of oxygen on Earth and transforms into a giant creature. After violent persuasions, which first begin with a little dog scaring it, an Italian army captures it. The mammoth alien, albeit gentle, turns hostile and ends up at the Roman Colosseum, one of the arch monuments of Italy. The final moments of the movie deal with a confrontation between the army and the clueless giant, who despite being strong enough, tries to flee and ends up serving as an example of human domination. Emir is gentle and friendly until it is attacked by the dog and the Italian army, who capture it with an electrocuting net. Confused and lost, the benevolent soul turns ruthless and ends up being called a monster. Emir is green with a humanoid upper half, clawed hands, and a Godzilla-ish lower half with a long tail. The skin of Emir is extremely scaly owing to the harsh chemical composition of the atmosphere on Venus. Emir's growls sound like elephant trumpets, with the attacks being not too gory but more defensive in nature be it with the other mighty creatures like elephants or with the Italian army. Once again, Ray Harryhausen the wizard weaves his magic and gives us a truthful experience. You can indulge in it yourself when you watch the gentle creature waking up after an electric glitch renders all the metallic restraints used to hold Emir ineffective. The whole scene never fails to make you implore for more of Ray's tricks, which can almost defeat a modern day shoot shot with a high frame rate. Medusa. Ray Harryhausen makes another of his scary toys come alive in Clash of the Titans, where we previously explained about the Kraken. This one is called Medusa the Gorgon, with snakes adorning her hair and death glowing in her eyes. In the Clash of the Titans, God Poseidon makes love with a lady priest at the Temple of Athena. The meagerness annoys the goddess greatly, and she curses the lady priest to turn into a dirty witch, who immediately metamorphs into Medusa the Gorgon. Medusa retires into a hideout with her renowned archery skills and a devilish stare which can turn anybody into brittle stone. The son of Zeus, Perseus, in a bid to save Princess Andromeda, the daughter of Queen Cassiopeia of Joppa, from a devilish kraken, learns that the only way he can defeat the monster will be to use the head of of another devil Medusa. Perseus ends up at the hideout of the scary witch, where two of his associates are shot dead by Medusa's skillful arrows. The sequence turns woeful for Medusa as Perseus, with his deceitful yet courageous tact, beheads the devil. He then takes her head to an exciting conclusion of the movie for an exquisite face-off with Kraken. Ray Harryhausen's Medusa is scary and pitiable at the same time, since we know that she is the result of a bittered god betrayed by a rapacious one. The dancing snakes, along with the scaly face, make her look real, but at the same time, frightening. The eyes are made to look huge, devilish, and bright, as the real kill lies in there. The imagination of Rey comes to full force as we see Medusa crawling and crowing with loud hissing breaths, searching for her assassin with the bow in her hand and sharp teeth treading revenge. The movements created here are special as Rey's Medusa resembles a character out of a horror movie, 
unlike other monsters and giants who are more warring rather than being ghostly. This adds to the complexity of representing genuine expressions that show loss, revenge, anger, and regret, all at the same time. Gobble up that popcorn and catch up on this 1981 epic. Hydra. It is a guardian appointed by the mighty gods to protect the golden fleece of the mythological ram Crethosimus. The ram was sacrificed to god Zeus, and according to Greek mythology, after this, the possessor of its golden fleece would be inked as a great king. In the 1963 movie Jason and the Argonauts, Jason, trying to avenge his father King Aristo's death at the hands of King Peleus, goes in search of the golden fleece. This would gather him the required support to rebel against Peleus. Jason tries to capture the Golden Fleece after finding its secret from King Aedes' beloved daughter Princess Medea. But the multi-headed giant, the protector of the Golden Fleece, Hydra, attacks Jason. One of his companions, Acastus, is mercilessly strangled to death by the monster reptile. Jason valiantly fights his devilish enemy, and the sequence is one of the best to be seen not only during those times, but to date. Hydra is a serpentine with several scary and venomous heads jiggling away at its nemesis in all directions. The tail is another powerful weapon of this mammoth reptile that can squeeze its opponent to death. The heads resemble a hybridization of a snake and a dragon. The eyes look bloody red, with a venomous tooth protruding from the base of the nose of every head. Ray Harryhausen himself highlights the fact that this was one of the most difficult designs he had to work on, as there were a head full of heads to light up this head fest. Hydra displayed Ray's attention to detail as each head of the Hydra displayed an expression and attacking posture independent from the others. The Children of Hydra's Teeth The ravage of guardian monster Hydra, which you just watched in the previous fragment in the 1963 movie Jason and the Argonauts, continues here. King Aedes, angered over the theft of the giant fleece by Jason and saddened over the Hydra's parish, sews the tooth of the dead giant into the ground from where seven skeleton soldiers arise. The undead begin attacking Jason and the Argonauts. Meanwhile, Medea and Argo escape as Jason and his companions try to thwart the skeleton attack. The methodical skeletons disband their enemies one by one with skillful collaboration as Jason's accomplices are killed. Jason courageously hits around the bones and then escapes by jumping into the sea. Ray dedicates two brilliant masterpieces in this 1963 movie with Hydra and then his skeleton soldiers. The postures and the alliance of the skeletons are shown so mesmerizingly that one tends to forget the era of its creation. The scene where the special effects treat us with skeleton soldiers chasing around Jason and the Argonauts gives an adrenaline rush. The careful blueprint of making multiple skeletons fight humans at the same time is breathtaking and once again makes Ray triumph as the best. Kudos to this brilliant animation artist who breaks open the gates of the animation world for his future tending artistry. The Retosaurus the 1953 movie, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, depicts one of the many monster attacks that New York has been enduring over the years across movies. Be it King Kong, Godzilla, Green Goblin, and whatnot. The history begins with an atomic bomb test carried out in a remote Arctic region. The plethora of heat that is bombarded by this explosion kicks alive a frozen dinosaur from the prehistoric era called the Retosaurus. The swervy reptile heads towards its home from the Mesozoic era, which happens to be, yes, you guessed it right, the modern-day New York of 1953. The 20-foot-something monster causes enormous damage and numerous deaths in the city as chaos erupts. The police try to take charge and hit back at the scary giant with gunshots. An injured and bleeding Retosaurus with a bazooka wound in its throat spills its blood across the city of New York, unraveling a deadly disease from Jurassic times and killing more citizens. 
the cinema progresses towards an adventurous climax when a radioactive isotope is planned to be punched into the wound in the throat of the dangerous creature inflicting a bloodless death. Ray Harryhausen's Ritasaurus, even though in black and white, rises to give goosebumps to the audience and is no less to what you get when you watch a modern day's technically advanced Godzilla. The Ritasaurus looks eerily like a mix between the iconic Tyrannosaurus and Gigantosaurus with an extremely scaly body. The monstrous creature has a mockingly voluptuous set of jaws coupled with sharp teeth that can tear off any hard metal with relative ease. Ray navigates his puppetry across a scaled-down model of New York City and overlaps it with live footage which gives you the same trembles that you get while watching an up-to-date San Diego from the Lost World. The hard work of the creators along with Ray is evident from the way the city has been miniaturized with minute details taken care of to make it look as realistic as possible. Guanji, the name, which represents a lizard in Mexico, is portrayed by another of the sublime works of art by Ray. Incidentally, here, it happens to be a bewildered and lost Allosaurus from the Jurassic times. In the 1969 movie, The Valley of Guanji, the dinosaur called Guanji lives in a forbidden valley of Mexico which a troop of cowboys stumble upon in search of their supposedly cursed circus horse. The valley is filled with all sorts of prehistoric dinosaurs, and a troop of cowboys and cowgirl encounter them numerous times only to flee. In an anxious turn of events, the group captures the humongous reptile and carries it back to cast it as a showstopper of the circus. Incidentally, Guanji gets released from its cage amid the circus and attacks people. In a mega finale, Guanji gets trapped in a cathedral where he is burnt alive. Guanji is a hungry Allosaurus, and Ray makes it blue with semi-scaly skin and scary sharp teeth ready to mince on its meat. Guanji's large silhouette shocks you as he walks in to pounce on an Ornithomimus, killing it instantly in his first appearance in the movie. There is a long list of melees in the movie, as Guanji mauls people, elephants, and other co-dinosaurs. Ray Harryhausen equips his darlings in the movie with less scaly skins, and the intention seems to give them a more polished look to invoke emotions for the animals, too. Despite being violent, it's best to leave the creatures to Mother Nature is a message that the movie tries to perforate through the audiences. Enjoy Guanji and a load of other characters in the Valley of Guanji as they enthrall you in this captivating spectacle. Troglodytes! Got the skull of one of them in my laboratory. He's coming closer! The Troglodyte. Of all the monsters discussed for a while now, the Trog, as he is affectionately called in 1977's movie Sinbad and the Eye of the Tiger, is the most lovable. As far as the story goes, Sinbad and his crew are on a mission to break an evil spell on Princess Casima, due to which he has been transformed into a baboon. During their expedition traversing across the land of Arimaspi, the team meets up with the eight-foot giant Trog. The first introductions are not quite friendly, as both species immediately become wary of each other. However, after an interaction with Prince Casim the baboon, Trog befriends Sinbad and his companions. Trog helps them to find the historical shrine where Prince Kasim's curse is broken, and he returns to his normal human form again. Trog again plays a pivotal role here, as a frozen saber-toothed tiger guarding the shrine comes to life due to the evil sorceress Zenobia and attacks them. The gentle giant he is, the Trog sacrifices himself to help his human friends. Trog is modeled on the Ice Age humans called Neanderthals, but the parallelism ends there by stuffing in a horn at the top of the head. Trog is hairy across his body and scowls in short bursts for everything and anything that he wants to communicate. The affectionate giant also seems to be smart as he helps the team by unlatching the doors to the shrine. Ray Harryhausen builds this portrait very lovingly as the expressions of the animations are touching when we watch Trog blabber, help, get courageous, and then die at the hands of the tiger to help his friends. Ray Harryhausen, being the master of his traits, tries to get this act to perfection, as even the trudge of Trog seems to be taken care of by playing with the stop-motion effects. Enjoy this monster as he touches your heart without a growl. The Rock 
The Rocks clock back to the first segment of the series, to the movie The Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. The movie takes us through an adventurous journey of Sinbad the Sailor and his crew, who want to rescue Princess Parissa and bring her back to her normal size. After the second escape from the ferocious Cyclops and killing him, Sinbad and his crew are misled by the evil Sakura to the inhabiting place of a giant double-headed vulture called Rock. Sinbad's hungry crew feast on the just-born chick hatched from the Rock's egg. The saddened but intimidated monstrous bird kills Sinbad's men. Sinbad is also hung up and dropped into her enormous nest by the Rock. Rock is said to be so humongous that its wings could cover the sun. The dreaded two heads of Rock seem to think independently and are not easily bogged down by their nemeses. The native scavenging nature of vultures are maintained as none of Sinbad's men are eaten but only killed. Ray Harryhausen tends to make this huge pawn of his work wonders for him by exploring a flying monster. The special effects take a new leap here as the rock wriggles with tiny humans who have just killed her baby. The perseverance of the scavengerous rock and the overlapping with the actual shots of men being caught and thrown off the cliffs make them look real and vengeful. Rock brings in a new dimension of artistic win to Ray, since we can imagine the plights of the makers to blend in special effects with actual human footage in air. Sinbad! Sinbad, help me, help! Marvelous Verdict The 1950s and 60s were the years when probably our fathers or even grandfathers ran around in their fives or tens without many special effects to lure them to a two-hour movie. Those were the days when the cinema world was still nascent and was about to churn out some of the best talents of all time. Some stories and books gave the world an imaginative experience, but not the best indulging experience into a fantasy world with gods, demigods, and monsters. As the saying goes, failures grind to make a dish called success. A lot of specialists like Ray Harryhausen tried different styles of animation effects to bring about a disruptive change to the viewing experience of the audience. The process was tedious, as the makers had to redesign the models repeatedly with minute changes to adapt to the next frame, which brought in the flipbook effect. It was imperative that only the most passionate and persistent designers could endure it to make the most memorable art, and this was imminent. Ray Harryhausen was one such lord of his puppets who went about his work nonchalantly with lots of focus on slow and smooth transitions. He pulled it off by whisking live footage and making sure that stop-motion animation would inflict very minimal jumpy effects on the final rendering. Be it the Cyclops chasing Sinbad, Kraken attempting to munch on Andromeda by rising off the sea, the Trog's bent walk, or even Guanji's sudden capture of the Ornithomimus, each of these scenes gives us a sense of the dedicated piece of his heart that Ray gave to them which made them such wonderful jewels. These are studied by prominent art schools even till now. Ray Harryhausen gave the world the first and most surreal monsters that we so badly deserve. He brought in a rebellious set of thoughts to bring larger-than-life incidents involving heavens and hells onto our screens, where people could sit and forget their own world being high on a mystical realm. It is due to such high benchmarks set by some talents in the yesteryears of cinema that we now have such an unbelievable experience for an hour and a half of our paid showtime. Effectively, he brought out the vivid fantasies of our grannies and mamas with which we heard our bedtime stories, and finally found the means of pasting those characters with appropriate dread. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone.